How many times in life do you feel like your strength is just worn down to nothing? You're tired, you're worn down, and you just, you just feel like your strength is gone. I know that a lot of times in my life that that has happened, and I, and I know that there are people out there who you know, are feeling the same way. You, know, you, you go through life, and it's not that you don't get enough sleep at night. You, know, you, you get your eight hours of sleep, you get up, you, you eat right, you take care of yourself, you, you go to work, and you, know, you, you do what you're supposed to do. But even, even the strongest of, of humans get to the point sometimes where they just feel absolutely zapped of their strength. Today we're going to talk about strength and how Christ gives us that strength and how we should be drawing upon that well for strength. We're going to continue our series in Ephesians this morning. We're going to be in chapter 3 and we're going to read 14 to 21. It's the end of the third chapter. If you read along with me. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width height and depth of God's love, and to know that the Messiah know the Messiah's love that surpasses all knowledge, that surpasses knowledge, so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in you, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever. And ever. Amen. Paul kind of is, is picking up where he left off in, in 3 1, where he, he started to give a prayer. And he, he, you know, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And he stops abruptly, like we talked last week. And, and he kind of goes in deeper into this mystery that God has charged him to disseminate to the masses. And here in verse 14, Paul picks up that same thought that he left with back in 3.1 here in 3.14. And he says, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father in verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. You see, Paul continues his prayer, and his prayer is to the Father, the original Father who created everything. And it says there that, that for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, you know, that's it's the model family. It's, you know, the word father comes from our heavenly father. It's, it's why we have fathers on earth. And, and when a father here on earth doesn't model the godly love that he should, that's why we have such issues with God as a father. Because we, we see, kind of see our earthly fathers as an example of the Heavenly Father, which um, being a father myself, I, I know that I definitely fall short <laughs> in that category. So, you know, to look at our earthly fathers and, and knowing that we have, that they have faults or, and we have faults. Um, as children, we need to understand that our earthly fathers are flawed. But, we have a heavenly father who is perfect and it's through him that you know we are named so because we all go back to uh, a common ancestor through adam and eve and god is their father who created them paul also says here in this this opening this opening thing he says for this reason i bow my knee before the father uh, for whom every, you know, family, uh, every family in heaven and on earth is named, you know, that for this reason, you know, and he stated this in, in, you know, three, one, 
but he states it again here for this reason. He's not just talking about this previous stuff here in chapter 3. He's talking about chapters 1 and 2 also. He, he's talking about all of this stuff that he has covered thus far in Ephesians. And the idea is, is that, you know, because, for this reason, because the Jews and the Gentiles are united spiritually, Paul is, is going to go on here and he's, he's going to say he wants us to realize this unity experientially in five ways. Verse 16, he goes on, he says, I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory. Okay, he wants us to be granted this according to the richness of God. He's praying that we know these things. And he, he kind of, it's not really a list, but you know, you, 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 know, you go through and read and there's five different things that, that, that he's praying that, that we um, are granted by God. Okay, And he's, he's praying this for us. In verse 16, he's, he prays, he says, um, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Paul is praying that, that we would be strengthened with power in the inner man through the Holy Spirit. He, he's, he's wanting us to be strengthened by God. You see, on our own, my friends, we are, are, are human. And, and because we are human, we are weak. But through the Holy Spirit, for those of us that have accepted Christ into our lives, we have the ability to have our spiritual life strengthened and, and they're given strength and power through that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. You see, we're, we're, we're you know, such beings that, that, we're, that we are so weak and we, we succumb to our fleshly desires and our spiritual lives wax and wane. You know, we don't read the Bible as much as we should and, and we don't pray as, as often as we should and we don't you know we don't we don't serve as often as we think we should you see our, our spiritual lives you know yeah I, I've, I've actually got a sermon series that i i preach through the the spiritual disciplines um it's a book by richard foster and I, I've, I've preached this in other churches before um, but it's, it goes through the 12 um spiritual disciplines and um you know, we kind of realize that after a certain series like that, it's like, you know, you, you begin to realize just, just how weak we really are. You know, you, you really start to realize it after a sermon series like that, you know, and it's like, you know, wow, we, we, we are extremely weak as humans. But my friends, through that Holy Spirit, our spiritual lives are given strength and power. And that's what Paul wants us to realize right here, that we would be strengthened with power in the inner man through that Holy Spirit. He continues on in 17a, that first half of, of 17 there. He says, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul is, is praying that we would be, that we would realize this unity experience, experientially that the Messiah may dwell in our hearts through faith. And that, that phrase there that Paul uses, it literally means to be at home in. You know, that, that Christ would, would be at home in our hearts through faith. And to be at home, you know, the idea is that Christ would, would be deeply rooted in our lives and deeply rooted so much so that the fact that, 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 that he is the, he's, you know, we are rooted by him and we are centered on him. So that way when storms do come, we are so rooted in him that the wind and waves of other teachings don't blow us over. The rest of 17 here, 17b and, and 18, he says, I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love. You see, 
Paul is praying here that, that rooted and established in love, we would know the sheer immensity of God's love. You see, he, he's praying before that we'd be strengthened with power in the inner man through the Holy Spirit. And then he says that, that the, may, may the Messiah dwell in our hearts through faith to, to make his home and be deeply rooted in us. And, and again, here, he reiterates that idea of, of being rooted, you know, of a plant and a tree kind of sense, being rooted down, but also established as in like a building, like the cornerstone that we talked a few weeks back, you know, you, that cornerstone is set and, and that, that we would, we would be in line and firmly established and firmly established in love is what he's saying. And that we would know the sheer immensity of God's love. You see, God put a huge plan together in order to save us. And, and my friends, he has pursued us all of our lives. Every single waking moment that we have been alive, God is pursuing us relentlessly, wanting us to come to faith in Jesus Christ so that he can have a relationship with us. Because, my friends, that sin that exists in our lives separates us from God. And when there is no atonement there, there is a veil that's still there. We can't access God. If we've got sin in our lives, we cannot access God. Jesus Christ is the only way to remove that barrier of sin so that we can access God. God has pursued us. You know, not only does God want us to mentally comprehend, but God wants us to actually acquire this comprehension. He wants us to really grasp a hold of the comprehension of his love. And, and when, we, when we go from a mental comprehension to an actual comprehension, an actual acquiring of this comprehension, when this happens, that is what comes out in our actions. When we, when we mentally comprehend something, and then move it from here to actually acquiring it, it's going to flow out in the form of our actions. And we're going to be a godly, loving person. And it's not by our own doing at all. As we've stated before, it is by the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Verse 19a, that first half of verse 19 there, he says, And to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge. Paul is praying that we would know and experience Christ's love that surpasses all knowledge, my friends. And, you know, Christ willingly went to the cross and, and took the punishment for what you and I deserve. And again, it, it's not just that we would, we would know, but that we would know. Christ's love. And the more we know, my friends, and, and, and I speak this from personal experience, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. And the more we realize that we have a lot more to learn, and that the, the possibilities are endless uh, of the things that we need to glean out of the Word of God. You know, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. And the final thing here, number five, 19b says, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, Paul is actually praying here that we would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, my version says it a little bit different, but, but that word, when he, when, when he talks about being filled, it's not just being filled. It's, it's talking about filled to the measure. And, and, and the idea is, is that... Um, we would be filled with Christ is the idea, you know, because we, we, um, we can't, <laughs> we're not God and, but Jesus is, and to be filled with Christ is to be filled to the measure with God. Okay. And this is a, and what this is, is a, in an expansion of uh, John 17, 20 to 23, as a matter of fact, and I'd like to kind of go back and, and read those four verses there. He says, uh, Gee, this is Jesus actually praying in the garden. And Jesus says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message, meaning the apostles, 
May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us so the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one so the world may know you and have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. My friends, this is the unity that Paul is talking about here in the last part of verse 19. Christ is praying for this in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's crucified. And he's talking about how we would all be one He's praying for those of us who would come to faith through the apostles. He's praying that we would be one, that we'd believe in him. And he's praying that we would be one in them, in God. You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the uh, Holy Spirit. Not only is he talking about the unity of, but he's talking about being filled with the fullness of Christ of himself. He's talking about being filled and unified in them. You want to know an interesting fact about that? And I think this is amazing. Yeah, I just, this, this is so, this is so cool. (laughs) It's just one of those facts that kind of blow my mind. We, as we read the Bible, we have the luxury of reading from the beginning of time through the entire New Testament. And we even have a book called Revelation where we can actually kind of see into the future of what's going to happen. But the thing is, is all of these little books of the Bible were not written all at once. Through time, the Holy Spirit inspired men to write down what they had seen and heard. And God preserved it as a testimony for all time. The events of John obviously happened while Christ was on earth and in around, around the time frame of, of 30 AD. Paul wrote Ephesians in around 60 to 62 AD. The Gospel of John was not written until 90 AD. So that means that Paul is expounding in a letter to the Ephesians about something that Christ had said and John wrote about 30 years into the future. That's incredible. Christ had already said it, and obviously the other apostles knew he said it, but these words hadn't been written down into the fashion like they are now. Paul wrote about this unity, and I, and I know, I know for a, I, I, I just, I know in, for a fact in my heart of hearts that I know that those core 12 know of this unity that Christ was praying for in the garden because the, the Holy Spirit says that he, you know, Christ says the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of all these things when I, you know, after I return back to heaven. And he did. And, and, and these guys went around talking about this this unity that Christ had that we find in chapter 17. But Paul didn't, or not not Paul, but John didn't get around to actually pinning down uh, until around 90 AD when he was in exile on the island of Patmos. I just think that's amazing that the Holy Spirit is, is it just, it, it's incredible the way all of the Bible fits together, but yet all of these letters weren't written at the same time, and they just they they complement off of each other, and it's just it's amazing how it all fits together. And, and, and I just it baffles me when people say that that this book is just a bunch of words written down by men. I'm just I'm sorry, I don't I don't buy that for a minute because when I read this book and see how well it fits together. You know, it just, it's amazing. You know, people argue back, those same people argue back that there are, are, you know, apparent contradictions um, within those verses. And it's like, you know, I don't believe that for a second. Not when you take in the proper context, 
You know, it's it's not just a, a naivete thing. You know, it, it's you, when you take things in the proper context, who the letter was written for, and the fact that John himself writes down that of all the stories were told about what happened with Jesus be written down, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to fill the pages that would be filled. My friends, you know, we... Why it's called faith? You know, like I said, I, I know deep within my being that that these disciples had been talking about this stuff because the Holy Spirit reminded them of this. They reminded it. He reminded them of the unity that Christ spoke about and prayed for in the garden for all of us. He he prayed for himself. He prayed for the apostles and the prophets, and he prayed for all of the believers that would come after them. And, and mind you, he was God. So yes, 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 you were on his mind when he was praying those verses in the Garden of Gethsemane. Paul rounds this out with nothing but praise and glory to God. He says, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, According to the power that works in you, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. When we realize these five things, when we, we realize that we got, that, that Paul's praying that we be strengthened with power in the inner man through the Holy Spirit, that the Messiah may dwell in our hearts through faith that rooted and established in love, we would know the sheer immensity of God's love, that we would know and experience Christ's love that surpasses all knowledge, that we would be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. When we realize this, it brings us to the point that there's only one thing left to do. And that, my friends, is to give honor and praise and glory and worship to the God Almighty who has worked all of these things together. And it is no accident. It is not by accident that any of this happened. It's by the will of God. It is by the moving of God. And Paul is praying here for this and for us. And he gives him all the praise for it, which he does. Paul uses this prayer, which is found in the latter part of chapter 3. He uses this prayer to transition from, from focusing on reshaping our thinking to focusing now on how reshaping our thinking is going to reshape our actions. Okay, And that's exactly where Paul is going. This prayer is a transition. The first three chapters have been focused on reshaping our thinking. The next three chapters of Ephesians are going to be focused on how reshaping our thinking is going to reshape our actions. Okay? All of this is working together. Okay? And if, my friends, we, we go through our lives, you know, and, and as I talked about at the beginning, we're, we, we always, you know, we're weak. We, we feel like, you know, our strength is zapped. Even the strongest of believers at times, you know, we feel like our, our strength is just absolutely zapped. And, and, you know, we're tired and we're worn down and we need that rejuvenation. And that's where we need to fill our lives with God. And we need to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God so that we can go on. And my friends, when we find ourselves in those low spots, we find ourselves, you know, we have those desires that we want to reshape our actions. And my friends, if we are going to reshape our actions, it starts by reshaping the way we think. And reshaping the way we think, and, and, and that, my friends... The absolute core of that is Jesus. We start reshaping our actions by reshaping our thinking. And reshaping our thinking starts with Jesus Christ. And, and apart, because my friends, apart from Jesus, 
we do not have the strength to do it on our own. Paul says that over and over. I always go back to you know Romans 7 and Romans 12 too. You know, Romans 7 talks about the Romans 7 talks about how the um, you know the flesh versus the spirit and, and you know we we have this battle going on inside of us and how Romans 12 2 says that, that you know we should not be conformed to this world but we need to be renewed with our in our minds and we need to be renewed in him you know, don't conform to this world but renew your minds my, my friends we don't have the strength to do it on our own we need Jesus Apart from him, we can do nothing. Because if we're ever going to change our actions, it starts by reshaping our thinking, and that all starts with Jesus. We, you know, no matter what we do from there, it all starts with him. You know, we, we've got all kinds of medical sciences out there. We've got all kinds of things that we can use as tools that help us to that but the core of it all is Jesus and we have to filter it all through him we have to filter everything through the Bible through the Word of God and through Jesus Christ because if it doesn't line up and it doesn't match then it's no good and it's not going to do us any good at all as a matter of fact it will tear us away from God instead of draw him draw us closer to him so if reshaping our actions starts with reshaping our thinking and reshaping our thinking <laughs> It, 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 reshaping our thinking it begins with Jesus it, it begs this one question you're going to find that up on the screen it begs this question right there who do you say Jesus is because we're at the end of this whole reshaping our thinking chapter and before we go on next week to reshaping our actions, we have to be confronted with that question right there. We have to be confronted with the question of who Jesus is to you. Is he Lord and Savior? Or is he some historical figure that you just kind of see as a really good idea to, to, to listen to? My friends... We need to draw upon Jesus for strength in all aspects of our lives. And it all begins with him. Who do you say Jesus is? And if Jesus is Lord and Savior, then by golly gee whiz, he needs to be that. And the decision today is yours.